Harry Potter and the Ancient Nemesis by Gregor Walton Prologue Lydia knew two things. Actually, she knew many things, but two were crucial. She knew she wanted to find her father. She also knew that if everyone else had failed, then a ten-year-old girl would need a miracle to find him. All right, she was clever for her age, as everyone was fond of telling her, but even she would need a miracle. And if it involved having an adventure to get to the miracle, well, that was just the way it had to be. Visiting her Uncle Ambrose, her dad's older brother, might have promised to be fun, hardly an adventure. But then, of course, her uncle had complicated a simple shopping trip into something truly weird. The adventure part of it, she supposed, started when he got them arrested. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Chapter 1. Half-Term "'Are you all right, Stinger, with your uncle over the half-term?' Lydia's mother asked, turning off the dual carriageway. "'Yeah,' Lydia enthused, nodding her head so that her long blonde hair rippled. "'Uncle Ambrose has lots of books and things, and he talks about my dad.' Lydia glanced across at her mother. She was biting her bottom lip while she drove. You never talk about him, Lydia pouted. I do sometimes, Mrs. Ward protested. Lydia folded her arms and made a small grunt. Well, it's difficult, her mother explained. It makes me sad and worried because we don't know anything. An uneasy silence fell between them for a long moment. They crossed over the river to the outskirts of the town. Lydia looked over the parapet of the bridge and along the lazy brown river to the distant wharves and warehouses of the old port. Uncle Ambrose had lots of seafaring stories, but then Uncle Ambrose had stories about everything. "'I think your uncle has something interesting planned,' Mrs. Ward said to break the silence. Lydia's expression lifted. "'What is it?' "'Don't ask me. He doesn't let me in on your secrets. I'm sure he'll let you know in his own sweet time.' He's odd, but he's a good man. He looks after Grandma, Lydia noted. Lydia's mum smiled and nodded. He did. My mum always liked him. He used to make her laugh. And she always used to take more notice of what he said than she did of me. I had to get him to repeat everything I said before she'd believe it. That was true even before she was losing her memory. Mrs. Ward fell silent. Lydia looked at her. You've lost a lot of people, Mum. She sighed. You've lost people too, Lydia. I've still got my mum, and I don't remember Dad. Uncle Ambrose is kind of like a dad, part-time. An old dad. An old, weird dad. Lydia smiled. With crazy hair and a mad beard. They giggled as they turned into the street where Lydia's uncle, Ambrose Ward, lived. They pulled up outside his house. There was nowhere to park, but, being a cul-de-sac, they were fine for a moment while Lydia got out. The door of the house opened, and Uncle Ambrose appeared, wearing his customary tweeds. "'Is that you, Lydia?' he asked. "'Apparently,' was the exasperated reply from her mother. "'Appearances can be deceptive,' Ambrose warned. And greetings to you, my dear Catherine. You've plotted your beard, Uncle Ambrose, Lydia observed, as he helped her with her bags. I had to. Your mother was reluctant to let me plait hers, he replied with a wink. Lydia grinned. Meow, added Uncle Ambrose's cat, Jacaranda. Hello, Jack, Lydia chirruped. She squatted down to welcome him with open arms. 
Jack leapt up, and they nuzzled each other as only a soft old cat and a pet-deprived young girl could. Well, if you could bring Jack around in, I will endeavour to carry your assorted luggage all by myself. Ambrose, it's one case and a carrier bag, Lydia's mother said. If you can't manage, I'll carry one. I can manage both, he assured her. Provided you carry me, of course. Get away with you, she laughed. She locked the car and followed them to the house. Come along, then, Ambrose smiled, taking Lydia's bag. Pasta of some description for tea. Great, Lydia smiled back, and led the way inside. I shall take your bags upstairs, her uncle said, doing so. Lydia put the cat down and gave her mum a hug. Catherine called her goodbyes up to Ambrose, kissed Lydia on the forehead, and went back out to the car. I have something arranged for this week, Ambrose called down to Lydia. How would you like to go to London for a few days? Lydia ran back to the bottom of the stairs. Really? Ambrose beamed as he came back down. I have something to which I must attend while we're in London. But for the remainder of the visit, we can peruse all the sights and such. Lydia bounced in her seat. What do you need to do in London, Uncle? Ambrose finished a mouthful. Do you recall Tina, a grandmama's care worker, Lydia? Her mouth now full of pasta, she nodded enthusiastically. Well, her uncle continued, it appears she has gone missing, and unaccountably nobody seems to care. Oh, she's sweet. What happened? It is difficult to say. I saw her car outside Mrs. Glenson's house last week, late in the evening. It was still there the following day, as it is now. Being of sound mind and inquisitiveness, I rapped upon Mrs. Glenson's door. Nobody answered. A neighbour informed me Mrs. Glenson had died. There had been an ambulance and police cars around at the time. The neighbour knew nothing of Tina. Indeed, it was as if she had no memory of Tina, though I know they've met often. Lydia had stopped eating now. She was quite used to the odd way her uncle spoke, but the events made her pause. Ambrose put down his fork. I paid a visit to the police station. They were unable to furnish me with any details. On my return, Kevin from across the road. The one with the labradoodle. Lydia loved dogs as well as cats. The very fellow. He told me Mrs. Glenson had indeed passed away, under unusual circumstances. She had not been in the full bloom of health, but neither was she expected to die at this juncture. This explained why the police had attended. According to Kevin, some immediately suspected her grandson. People were scandalised he had encountered mental health issues. Ambrose frowned and smoothed a wrinkle in the tablecloth. He had not had the happiest of lives. His mother died when he was a small child. He was bullied at school. His father passed away mere weeks ago. I doubt people would be so harsh with the lad, had only his physical health suffered. Nevertheless, I inquired of Kevin whether he knew of Tina's whereabouts. His reaction was the same thing again, as though he had never heard of her. He used to chat with her when she came to Grandmama's. She used to love to have a laugh with him after her visits. How could he not remember? Lydia frowned. Well, exactly. It didn't seem he was trying to conceal anything. It was simply that he could vaguely remember a care worker, but nothing specific about her. Furthermore, nobody mentioned Tina's car being there at the time. You have seen how excruciating the parking situation can be here. It is inconceivable nobody would notice an extra car. So why London, Uncle? Forgive me. I will get to the point, I promise. Once would be nice, Lydia muttered. Quite so. Ambrose stroked his plaited beard and continued. I asked around about Granville, Mrs. Glenson's grandson. People were vague about why he had not been questioned. Everyone assumed there must be a good reason. 
Nobody knew what. Not even the police. Lydia was only picking at her strands of linguine now. Anyway, this Granville had been living with his grandmamma. It would be reasonable for him to return. I have visited the house several times, but to all appearances there has been nobody there. I went to the care agency to inquire after Tina. They checked their books and found she was no longer on contract. Whilst they were looking, I read her address upside down off the register. Oh, clever boy, Lydia said with sarcasm. He raised an eyebrow at her. Feel free to get on with it, she prompted. Oh, yes, indeed. I visited the house she had been sharing, and once again nobody seemed alarmed. They barely remembered her. None of the people who should remember her do. We two were the exception. I asked her erstwhile housemates if I might check her room. They were unconcerned. I availed myself of the opportunity, but unearthed nothing unusual. There was no indication she had packed to go away. All her makeup and girlish palaver were still there. I happened across her diary, however. And you read it? Lydia accused. Out of concern for her best interests, naturally. Lydia's scowl conveyed her views on the sanctity of a girl's diary. This is not like your dear mamma nosing about in your diary, if such a thing were ever to occur. Tina might be in danger. What did you find out? Reading between the lines, and wading through the terrible handwriting, but spelling atrocious grammar. Go on, uncle. She seems to have been smitten with young Master Granville. It's hardly what one would call an attractive young fellow, yet she was obsessed with him. Ambrose stopped and pulled his beard a few times before continuing. She had had some odd conversations with him. He would tell her stories about another world hidden within our own. She was excited by this and wanted to know more than he would tell. She wrote how she would dearly like to read his journal and see his collection. Collection? Yes, I was unsure what she meant. I'm not sure he was not simply leading her on. Then what? I, so to speak, broke into Mrs. Glenson's house and into Granville's room. After some neighbourly nosing around, I discovered his journal. I have it upstairs, even now. It is unusual. Thick leather and brass cover, and the pages are parchment or vellum or some such. What does it say? Oh, I see. A gentleman's journal is not as sacrosanct as a girlie's diary, then. Uncle? It is merely raving. The diary speaks of another world, community, hidden from us, of how he found it, and of his collection of artefacts, books, and other paraphernalia. <laughs> I'm sure it is all delusion. And London? Indeed, we alight upon the original point at last. It talks about a certain person in London, of whom Granville believes seems to be wary. It also speaks of how he may be found. Think this person's real? Ambrose sat back and sighed. If he is, he might know something about Tina, or he may be in danger from Granville. If he does not exist, we may have a few days in London. But if he does exist, he needs to see this journal. Here we are, Lydia, Ambrose said. They were in a street, away from the busy hubbub of London. It was quite broad, lined on either side with white stone buildings. Offices, mostly, judging from the brass plaques by each door. It was the first time they had emerged from the underground into the open air since they had arrived at Euston Station. Can you see in an old phone box? Lydia's uncle asked. Isn't it that big red thing down there? He looked at where she was pointing. Good gracious, how did I not notice that? he asked. Because you're old and silly? Hmm, no, he said. That cannot possibly be the reason. She grabbed for his hand, stubbing her finger on the cases he was carrying. 
she dragged him down the street to the phone box. Now what? she asked. We should make our way inside, of course. It didn't seem likely the two of them and their luggage would fit, but it was roomy once they were inside. Ambrose lifted the handset to his ear. He heard an old-fashioned dialing tone. Well, here goes, he said, and dialed the number. Six. Two. Four. Four. Two. After a couple of breathless seconds, he smiled. It is ringing. A woman's voice answered. The voice filled the booth, as though she were standing beside them rather than speaking through the telephone. How may I help you? We are here to see the head of the aura office, Ambrose announced. Very good. Come on down, came the reply. Please replace the handset. Ambrose's hand hovered for a moment before dropping the handset back onto its cradle. Immediately there was a rattle in the returned coins tray. He reached in and pulled out two shining badges, a large V and the word visitor emblazoned across each. He handed one to Lydia and pinned the other to his jacket. She said, come down. How? Lydia was saying, but a grinding noise and a lurching sensation interrupted her. They looked at each other. I imagine that answers your question, her uncle smiled. The phone box was sinking. The pavement appeared to rise all around them, obscuring the paned windows. As the daylight disappeared, it was pitch black for a moment. Then a small incandescent light bulb lit up overhead. Lydia relaxed. With a muffled grinding, the box descended for what seemed like several minutes, though it was probably less than one. At last, a glow of warm golden light appeared at ankle level and rose all around them. After the dim light bulb, it made them squint with its brightness. Lydia stepped out of the phone box into a broad vaulted hall with tiled walls. The curved ceilings were a warm golden colour and seemed to be the source of light. Strings of blue-green writing were moving across the ceiling. On the opposite side of the hall was a line of ornate but ill-matched fireplaces. Ambrose looked around, taking in their surroundings at a glance. This way, he said, turning to the right. He put their bags on the smooth wooden floor and wheeled them along. They heard a soft whooshing sound and turned to see a woman appearing from one fireplace. She was, from her dress, either a street performer or an art student, or possibly even on her way to a fancy dress party. She wore pleated robes of far more colours than decency generally allowed, and a wide-brimmed pointed hat. There are no people like show people, Ambrose murmured quietly in an aside to his niece. Thankfully. Down the hall stood an ornate fountain, topped with sculptures of what appeared to be fantasy characters. As they drew near, the hallway widened into an atrium. Lydia noticed gold and silver coins in the fountain. She formed an idea. Uncle, she asked, is this a theme park? I am beginning to wonder, he frowned, looking around. He spotted what appeared to be the reception desk and headed towards it. Lydia followed, smiling to herself. Hello, said Ambrose to one of the well-groomed young ladies on the reception desk proffering the visitor's badge on his lapel. How may I help? she smiled. We are here. He stopped for a second, and Lydia noticed, as her uncle must have done, the small crimson cap she wore. It matched her uniform, but looked like a small, squat, witch's hat. We are here to visit to the head aura, Ambrose continued. Level two, the lifts are just ahead. Is there anywhere we could leave our bags? he asked. Certainly, sir, she smiled. One of our elf staff will be happy to take them. She picked up a slim wooden stick and tapped it on one of several brass panels on one side of her desk. Moments later, a small creature or person or something appeared beside them. It was shorter than Lydia. It had a small body with an oversized head, huge ears and a long nose. The creature beamed at them. 
I'm worth, the receptionist said to the small person. Please take our visitors' luggage into storage until they need it again. Certainly, miss, the elf piped up. Here's a token for your bag, sir. Lemworth smiled at Ambrose and handed him a glittering crystal with the number seven inlaid in bright cherry red. Then, with a faint pop, he and the luggage disappeared. Come along, Lydia, her uncle said, hurrying towards the lifts before she could speak. What the heck? she hissed at him as they approached the row of golden gratings, which were the doors to the lifts. You recall I spoke of the craziness in Granville's journal? It is either true or I am as befuzzled as he is. One of the golden gratings in front of them slid open and out stepped an odd-looking man, wearing long white robes with an iridescent sheen. He had a long red beard down to his waist. A tall conical hat in a sparkling pale blue topped his hair-fringed head, fine silver symbols adorning it. He smiled at them and nodded then walked on with what sounded like a chuckle. They entered the lift. Ambrose slipped the crystal token into his pocket. That, that was a wizard, Lydia stammered. So it would seem. This is what Granville's other world was all about. Magic and wizards. Destination, please, asked the lift. Its disembodied voice sounded like the one they had heard in the phone box. Level two. Or a headquarters, please, Ambrose responded. They felt a vaguely nauseating sense of movement, and before long the lift reopened to a different view. Level two, the lady's voice intoned. Department of Magical Law Enforcement, or a headquarters, and Wizengamot Administration. The corridor floors here were marble, flecked with gold. The walls were alabaster, or perfectly painted to seem so. It was lit by sunlight streaming in through regularly spaced windows. Something moved overhead. Just before the lift gates closed again, several hovering paper planes darted inside. Others continued to hover against the corridor ceiling. The couple followed the corridor to the right, towards a pair of large open doors. Uncle, have you seen the view? He looked through the nearest window. There was no view as such. There was sky. There were small, fluffy clouds. There was sunlight. That was all. I believe we are still underground. These are merely projections, or... Or magic, Lydia suggested. Do you promise this isn't a theme park or a joke or something? I promise. Ambrose looked down seriously at her. Should we go on? Why not? Anything for a weird life. They passed through the double doors and into a reception area. A sign hung over the door. It read, Aura Headquarters. To one side stood a desk, at which sat a stony-faced receptionist, dressed in black and grey robes. She wore her hat, but had a tangle of grey wiry hair, which looked like a helmet. Yes, she barked. We are here to talk to the head of the Aura office, Ambrose replied. Do you have an appointment? She almost shrieked at them. No, but then why would he want to see you? Ambrose drew a deep breath. I think the fact that we are here in the Ministry of Magic, and that we are what I believe you call muggles, might interest him. The receptionist's frown slid upwards into her hair helmet as our eyes widened. Perhaps you should go in, she breathed, through the door and first office on your left. 